welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach, and my mission is to help you get into the best shape of your life, regardless of your age, so that you can show up in life as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. I want to let you know that if you enjoy this podcast, I have additional free resources over at silveredgefree.com. There you'll find my mini guides on nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle. So feel free to head over there, scroll through the guides, and download anything that looks helpful to you. Today we have another edition of the Coach's Corner, so no guest today, it's just me, and we'll be back next week with our regular interview format. But here's what we're covering in today's episode. I start off talking about my new holiday accountability offer, and I'm launching that today. And then I move on to share a couple of news stories that I read this week that I found interesting. Next, I discuss what's more important for weight loss, how much you eat versus what you eat. And believe it or not, there's actually a war being waged right now on social media over this topic. Then I discuss the role of supplementation for folks over 50, including my current supplementation routine, And I wrap up by sharing my thoughts on why I'm so passionate about fitness. Let's get on with today's show. Okay, folks, I'm really excited about this. I've decided to launch a holiday accountability group. What is a holiday accountability group, you ask? Great question. This is a program that will run from November 1st through December 31st and is designed to help us get through the holidays in a sane and balanced manner. Now, the holidays are a tricky time for many of us. They are often emotionally charged, and there are usually tons of opportunities to overeat and overdrink. So the idea of this program is to create a support community where we help hold each other accountable and can have honest dialogue about our struggles and our wins. And I'll be with you every step of the way to support you with my best tips for staying on track and healthy during these festive times. Here's what you'll get if you decide to join. Number one, an individual nutrition plan that is specific to you and your goals. This isn't a cookie-cutter, one-size-fits-all diet plan, but rather a personalized nutrition plan that will give you guidance on what and how much you should eat daily based on your specific goals. Now, for many of us, that will be weight maintenance, but it could be weight loss or muscle building, etc. Number two, you'll have membership in a private Facebook community. This is where we'll meet and support one another. Along the way, I'll give my best tips on living a balanced, sane, healthy lifestyle during these two months. We'll talk about strategies for maintaining nutrition, exercise tips, as well as stress control strategies. And number three are live weekly support calls. Each week, we'll have a live Zoom call where we can get together, ask questions, share challenges, and create a sense of community. If you can't attend any of the calls, we'll record them and make them available to view on demand. If this sounds like something you're interested in, here's the deal. The cost is nothing. Zero, zip, nada, completely 100% free, no strings attached. All you need to do to enroll is send me an email at coach at silveredgefitness.com saying you're in. And that's it. You'll get a confirmation email back from me with a short questionnaire so that I can prepare your nutrition plan, and I'll get you enrolled. Depending on interest in this program, I may need to cap the enrollment, so if you feel like this would be a helpful program for you, I'd encourage you to go ahead and sign up now. Again, just send me an email at coach at silveredgefitness.com letting me know that you want in. But why free? So, Full transparency, here's the deal. I want to run these types of programs and offers in the future, and frankly, I want to charge for them. But I've never run a private Facebook group, so you guys will be my pilot group. I'll get practice running this type of program, and you'll get some guidance and support along the way with absolutely no cost. It's already October, and the holidays will be here before you know it. So now is the time to start planning your strategy for how you're going to negotiate all those parties, cocktails, 
family gatherings, pies, cookies, and eggnog. I wanted to talk about a couple of things that I've read in the news in the last week that I want to share with you folks. And this first one was sent to me by a podcast listener, and I absolutely love the story. The headline reads, at 101, she's still hauling lobsters with no plans to stop. And this story highlights 101-year-old Virginia Oliver, who has spent her entire life lobstering off the coast of Maine. When she started lobstering at age eight, World War II was still more than 10 years in the future. Today, she still tends her lobster traps along with her 78-year-old son. I'll drop a link to this article in the show notes, which you can find at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 78. Here's another link that came across my news feed last week, and this one is from the folks over at Eat This, Not That, and the article is titled, Over 60, Never Do These Exercises, Says Trainer. Now, I want to talk about this one because these are the kinds of headlines that drive me absolutely crazy. The idea that there are exercises that people over a certain age shouldn't do is, in my humble opinion, complete BS. Now, this particular article, as it turns out, wasn't very offensive at all. They're quoting a trainer who's making a case that people over 60 are losing muscle fast and that their joints are not what they used to be and that older folks should train with, quote, body weight and lighter, more manageable weights, end quote. And she's probably correct about most people over 60 losing muscle and mobility, but it's my mission to reverse or at least arrest that. So what exactly are these exercises that those of us over 60 should never do? The first is the behind the neck pull down. And this is usually done on that lap machine that you see in gyms quite commonly. And I think I could probably make a good case that really nobody needs to do this exercise regardless of their age. Her second prohibitive movement is the barbell overhead press. And this is where I would start to take issue. She's making the case that us old farts simply lack the mobility in our upper back and our shoulders, which causes us to overcompensate by arching our lower backs. She's absolutely right that if we lack overhead mobility, which causes us to arch our backs overhead, that we should probably not do that. But I would argue that a better strategy might be to see if we can address this upper back shoulder mobility and get our 60-something lifter capable of pressing overhead. That way, when said 60-year-old travels on an airplane, he or she is perfectly capable of picking up their suitcase and putting it in the overhead compartment. Now, it is a reality that some older people are too far gone to completely rehabilitate overhead pressing, But for everyone else, I'd try to restore this very natural movement. Her third and final do not do this lift are shrugs, with her argument being that most people over 60 are very upper trap dominant, but lack strength in the upper back and mid to low traps, and that shrugs would exaggerate this imbalance. Okay, I suppose I could live with that. Shrugs are purely an accessory exercise, and if you're not a bodybuilder, I suppose you could live without them. But if you're over 60 and you want your upper traps to really pop, properly performed shrugs would be a great exercise for you. The trainer then goes on to suggest two exercises that people over 60 should be doing, and those are the suitcase deadlift, which is basically deadlifting two kettlebells, and the Turkish get-up. I have to say I'm a huge fan of both movements. Deadlifts in all of their variations are fantastic exercises, regardless of your age. And who doesn't love a Turkish get-up? Okay, so I admit that I was triggered when I read that headline, and that's what caused me to click into the story, which is probably the desired response from the marketing folks over at Eat This, Not That. And this one wasn't so bad. They seemed to me to be three strange exercises to say people over 60 shouldn't do. But my feeling is that there are no movements that you can't or shouldn't do over a certain age. Rather, let your fitness level and mobility be your guide. 
And if there are movements that you can't do, explore ways to shore up your weaknesses and try not to surrender to the prevailing notion that you'll just naturally lose basic functional movement as you age. If you're interested in reading this article, I'll drop this one into the show notes as well. Here's another great article sent to me by a podcast listener, and this one's from NPR and is titled, Weight Training Isn't Such a Heavy Lift. Here are seven reasons why you should try it. And this article states that, quote, it turns out there are loads of good reasons to add weight training to your regime or maybe even switch to it as a mid-pandemic fitness goal. Improve movement control, better cognitive abilities, enhance cardiovascular health, better bone development, reduction in chronic pain, and just plain old feeling better, end quote. And the article goes on to dispel seven myths, which are as follow. Myth number one, weightlifting will make you Arnold Schwarzenegger huge. The reality is, no, no, it won't. Regular weight training can help you build lean muscle mass, get toned, and be healthier. Myth number two, weight training won't help you lose weight. The reality is, it's actually an excellent way to lose that excess weight. Myth number three, you have to start when you're young. Reality? Heck no. You can start at any age. It's never too late. Myth number four, you need fancy equipment and clothes. The reality is, no, you don't. A pair of shorts, tennis shoes, t-shirt, you're ready to go. And if you like to get decked out in the Lululemon and the fancy Reebok shoes, have at it. Myth number five, you need an expensive trainer. Reality? Well, you might need some guidance to get started, but you can often find that for free or find somebody to help guide you on your journey. Myth number six, weight training is all about the results you see that is looking buff. And the reality is, yeah, it's about that, but it's also about your overall health and it can help fend off chronic illness. Myth number seven, weight training is all about the body. But the reality is, that weight training can give you a mental boost as well. Anyways, I love this article. It seems like the benefits of strength training are going mainstream. Again, I'll drop a link to this article into the show notes if you'd like to read more. Also, if you see something fitness related in the news or have a subject you'd like me to discuss, please send it to me at coach at silveredgefitness.com. Okay, in the last edition of the Coach's Corner, I addressed the question of which is better for weight loss, cardio or strength training. This week, I want to talk about another controversy, and that's which is more important for weight loss, how much you eat or what you eat. Now, perhaps you're unaware, but there's a war being waged in the nutrition space right now over this topic. On one side, you have the folks claiming that the only way to lose weight is to be in a calorie deficit, that is, to consistently eat fewer calories than you expend. On the other hand, you have a new group saying, not so fast, the only way to lose weight is to alter what and when you eat. This argument typically centers around carbohydrates and insulin. This is often referred to as the carbohydrate-insulin model of obesity and argues that eating processed, especially ultra-processed carbohydrates, causes blood sugar to increase, which causes insulin to be released. So far, so good. That's how our bodies are supposed to react to simple carbohydrates. The problem arises when we eat too many of these processed foods too often. When we are constantly spiking our blood sugar and releasing insulin in response, we develop insulin resistance, which leads to all sorts of nasty things, including excess fat storage, which eventually leads to obesity. In the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, the idea is to limit how much and how often you eat carbohydrates, especially processed and ultra-processed foods and drinks. And certainly this makes sense. Swapping out nutritionally barren processed foods for nutrient-dense, healthy whole foods is a much healthier nutritional strategy. And studies show that 70% of the typical American's diet is made up of processed and ultra-processed foods. 
And consistently eating these foods leads to very poor health outcomes. Now, when I say there's a war going on between these two camps, I mean there are very smart people on both sides of this argument who feel strongly about this. And in fact, there are some epic posts on social media with proponents of each side going at each other. The calorie deficit camp claims that the only way the carbohydrate insulin model works is if it results in the dieter eating fewer calories than they expend on a consistent basis. And the carbohydrate insulin camp claiming that if you simply eat fewer carbohydrates less frequently, you don't need to worry about the actual amount you're eating. But here's my take on this. Why can't both sides be correct? Very few things in the nutrition space are clear-cut, black and white. Nutrition is nuanced and complicated, but I'm of the opinion that both of these camps have merit and are valuable contributors to obtaining and maintaining a healthy body composition. In fact, one of the first things I do with my nutrition clients is look at what they eat and tweak that first. And this almost always results in me upping their protein, often considerably, which means by default that they're eating less carbs. In other words, I spend more time, especially early on, concentrating on what they eat as opposed to how much they eat. But don't get me wrong, I also give them a daily total calorie goal to aim for as well. And as these clients start to eat more healthy protein and fats and start cutting out some of their processed foods, which are typically carbohydrates, they start feeling fuller on fewer calories. Their overall health and energy improves and they begin to lose weight. And then when we combine this holistic nutrition strategy with strength training, true magic begins to happen. If you're interested in learning more about the calorie insulin model of obesity and some practical tips for implementing a low insulin lifestyle, I interviewed Dr. Morgan Nolte a while back, and you can listen to that episode wherever you get podcasts or at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 61. She's definitely in the eat less, exercise more, doesn't work camp and makes a compelling case for why we should care more about what and when we eat for long-term sustainable weight loss. I get asked about supplements fairly often and people ask me what supplements I personally take. So here's my take on supplements. They are exactly what they sound like, supplemental to a healthy diet and lifestyle. In other words, you should get most, ideally all, of your nutrients from real whole foods and only supplement where absolutely necessary. And the best way to know what's absolutely necessary is to get regular blood panels and see where you might be deficient. Some of the most common supplements suggested for those of us over 50 include multivitamins, fish oil, fiber, vitamin D, calcium, and B12. Oftentimes, people take these supplements on very vague and general recommendations, and there are plenty of well-meaning lists online that state that seniors should take these supplements simply due to their age. But my strong recommendation is to get as many vitamins and minerals as possible through whole foods and natural sources and only supplement when that isn't feasible. For example, let's consider the above list of supplements and see where we could shore up our nutrition to help avoid supplementation. Multivitamins. Simply eating a varied diet of primarily whole foods, including plenty of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and healthy protein should cover most, if not all, of our needs in this space. Fish oil. We take fish oil for the healthy omega-3 fatty acids, And this can be found, not surprisingly, in oily fish like salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, as well as oysters. Not a fish fan? Skip the middleman and eat algae, specifically spirulina and chlorella. Fiber? Your best bet is to skip the Metamucil and load up on berries and apples, whole grains, broccoli, carrots, potatoes, beans, lentils, and other high-fiber foods. Vitamin D? Vitamin D is actually found in a few foods such as fatty fish, liver, cheese, and egg yolks, but our best bet for getting adequate vitamin D is actually healthy sun exposure. 
Calcium. Calcium is obviously best known in dairy products like milk, cheese, and yogurt, but it also occurs in foods such as seafood, some dark leafy greens, and some seeds and nuts. B12. We get B12 almost exclusively through meat and eggs, so your best bet here is to eat high-quality grass-fed and finished meats where possible, and vegetarian and vegans are going to need to supplement B12. Now, Here's one reason why getting your vitamins and minerals from whole foods is superior to supplements. Consider this. Where in nature would we ever find any vitamin in isolation? They just don't exist that way. Let's use vitamin C as an example. This is one of the most common vitamin supplements on the market. The only way to get vitamin C naturally is via whole foods. And let's consider the orange. This is one of the more popular sources of vitamin C. When we eat an orange, of course we don't only get vitamin C, but we also get B1, vitamin B9, potassium, as well as various flavonoids and carotenoids, and even some fiber. And of course, this isn't by any means an exhaustive list of all the compounds found in our humble orange, but our bodies and these foods have evolved alongside each other for a very long time. And as advanced as our science is, we simply cannot mimic the complexity of whole foods in an affordable, easy-to-swallow pill or potion yet. The vitamin C in the orange is going to be better absorbed and more complete than if we simply take a supplement without this other vast cast of helpful characters. All of that being said, there is a time and place for supplements. As mentioned above, you may have a medical need for supplementation, or perhaps you're on a restrictive diet. But another good reason is convenience. Many of us, myself included, take protein powder, for example. I've certainly taken my share of supplements in my lifetime. But here's what I'm currently supplementing with today. Protein powder, creatine, and algae. That's it. The protein powder I'm currently using is Muscle Feast's Whey Protein Isolate. I like this because it's from pasture-raised and 100% grass-fed cows, and it only has four ingredients, whey protein isolate, coca, sunflower lectin, and stevia. Next up is creatine. Creatine is a substance found naturally in muscle cells, and its function is to help muscles produce energy, especially during short, intense bursts of exercise. And the creatine that I use is just plain old generic creatine monohydrate from a company called Bulk Supplements. The last supplement I'm currently taking isn't really a supplement at all, but rather a food. But since it comes in a tablet or powder form, and it's usually found in the supplement aisle in health food stores, I'll include it here. And that's algae, specifically spirulina and chlorella. These two algae forms are the most nutrient-dense substances on the planet. In fact, one gram of spirulina or chlorella has the same nutrient value as 1,000 grams of fruit and vegetables. They contain over 40 vitamins and minerals, and they have the highest chlorophyll content of any other food on the planet, over a thousand times the amount found in most greens powders. I personally eat spirulina every morning and chlorella every evening, and is really the replacement for most other supplements. I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I'm not really a big fan of vegetables. I've used various greens powders in the past. I really like the Organifi green juice, but as a nutrition coach, I'm constantly asking my clients to eat their veggies, and I try to do my best to eat a wide variety of vegetables myself. But algae is my hedge against me not getting all the phytonutrients I need from vegetables. So in my mind, the daily algae takes the place of the multivitamin, the fish oil. I mean, where do you think that fish is getting all those healthy omega-3 fatty acids from? And the greens powders. I personally get all my spirulina and chlorella from a company called Energy Bits. They produce the world's cleanest and purest algae available on the market. And unfortunately, not all algae is created equal. If you'd like to learn more about the health benefits of algae, I interviewed the CEO and chief science officer of Energy Bits a while back, and she does a deep dive into the nutritional properties of algae 
And she does a great job of explaining why high quality algae is just so darn expensive. You can listen to that episode wherever you get podcasts or it's available at silveredgefitness.com slash 59. You can also learn more and shop for algae over at energybits.com and you can use the coupon code SILVEREDGE at checkout for a 20% savings. Okay, I want to wrap up with a brief discussion on why I'm so passionate about fitness over 50. Somewhere in my late 40s, I became very unhealthy. I spent close to a decade dedicated to endurance sports, primarily marathons and triathlons. But I burnt out on that. I grew weary of the monotony of running and biking all the time, as well as the nagging repetitive use injuries that were piling up. So I just stopped cold turkey. And at the time, I knew next to nothing about nutrition. I suppose I ate the typical American standard diet with a heavy emphasis on carbs. And I continued to eat this way after I stopped exercising. I was thin, very thin, from all the swimming, biking, and running, but now I was gaining a good bit of weight primarily around my midsection. I was what you would call skinny fat, very little muscle, and a decent amount of visceral fat. Not surprisingly, my health took a turn for the worse, which ended up with a two-day hospital visit because I thought I was having a heart attack. I wasn't. I was just very metabolically unhealthy. I was just doing everything wrong. I was sedentary. I ate like crap, which is to say primarily processed and ultra-processed foods. I was drinking daily. I slept poorly. And I had problems managing my stress. But what really scared me the most, even more than a couple days in the hospital, was my testosterone tanking. My libido had been waning, and one day I experienced erectile dysfunction. I was horrified and embarrassed. I was in my mid-40s, and I wasn't ready for a beer belly, Viagra, and a slow decline into ill health in old age. I've written about this painful time in my life and how I eventually overcame this, and I'll drop a note to that blog post into the show notes here, but suffice it to say that the fire was lit under me to clean up my act. Without any real direction, I started to clean up my diet, and that really meant having a salad once or twice a week to start with, and I joined one of those big globo gyms. But along the way, I started to research a lot. I devoured everything I could find on optimal nutrition and workouts. I waded through tons of garbage on the internet to find those hidden gems. And slowly but surely, my health turned around. Until suddenly, I found myself in my mid-50s as strong, fit, healthy, and vital as I'd ever been in my entire life. And I felt fantastic, almost superhuman. I found such joy in what my body was capable of and my energy levels and libido were at all-time highs. The magic really happened when I tied nutrition, exercise, and recovery all together into a holistic program. I focused on strength training with some short, intense interval conditioning. I ate primarily whole foods with an emphasis on quality protein, and I worked diligently on improving my sleep and controlling my stress levels. And these simple steps worked magic in my life. It certainly didn't happen overnight. And there was a lot of trial and error and missteps along the way. But I stuck with it and I'm so happy I did. It was literally a life transforming experience. So that's why I'm so passionate about fitness. I want to share this with as many people as I possibly can. I want to help change the common narrative that it's all downhill after 50 or that poor health and weakness are inevitable as we age. I want to shine a light on other people who are defying that narrative, and to educate and inspire those who aren't sure where to start. So if you're stuck and you don't know where to start, reach out to me. I'd love to start a conversation. If I can help you in any way, I will. Feel free to email me at coach at silveredgefitness.com.
Okay, that's our show for today, folks. I'll put links to everything we talked about in the show notes. And again, you can find that over at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 78. And don't forget to go over and check out silveredgefree.com for more great free resources on how to live your healthiest, strongest life after 50. In the meantime, I'd love to hear from you. You can always leave a comment on this episode page or feel free to email me with any comments or questions from today's show. Just send emails to coach at silveredgefitness.com. And of course, you can use that email to join the holiday accountability program. I want to thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I'll be back next week with my regular interview format, but that's it for today. So until next time, stay strong.